good afternoon and welcome everyone to conversation 26 of our um, special series on COVID-19 and uh, its impacts on regional Australia. My name is Kate Charters. I'm the chair of the National Steering Committee for SEGRA, which is the acronym for Sustainable Economic Growth for Regional Australia. SEGRA is Australia's premier organisation on regional issues and it is recognised as Australia's most credible independent voice on issues affecting regional Australia. Its strategic goal is to assist regional, rural and remote Australia to source and identify the knowledge, techniques and skills regions require to achieve successful economic growth and development. Um, we were established in 19... 97 and each year we uh, release a communique uh, about the key issues that um, have come out of our annual, com annual conference. We're um, delighted to be running this series um, and uh, we've been, it's been a very popular series uh, and so unfortunately we can't have a normal question and answer. We will have to rely on people using the chat box or the Q&A um, but we'll, Robert and I will keep a focus on that and um, try and ask people's questions um, as, as uh, we, we go along. Now, I'm delighted to welcome from London, uh, John Tamani to speak to us today. Uh, many of us encountered John Tamani in his um, Australian Business Foundation report, Place-Based Approaches to Regional Development, Global Trends and Australian Implications. Um, that was um, 10 years ago now. Um, and so we're very excited to uh, be able to uh, talk to you about your reflections on the last 10 years and perhaps a few reflections um, going forward. John is the uh, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning in the Bartlett School of Planning, University of College London. He has held visiting positions at Monash University, the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Adelaide University, Manchester Business School and Grand Sasso Institute. Currently, he is a visiting professor in the Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies at Newcastle University and in the School of Geography at the University College Dublin. He's a fellow of the Academy of Social Science UK and of the Regional Australia Institute. John's work has been sponsored by research councils and foundations, international organisations, national, regional and local governments, and non-government organisations in the UK and elsewhere. He contributes regularly to uh, broadcast and print media. And uh, recently he was the member of the UK 2070 Commission on Regional Inequalities, chaired by Lord Kerslake. Among his many publications um, is his book, Local and Regional Development, uh, which was published in 2017 and co-authored by Andy Pike and Andres Rigo. Jose. So welcome, uh, John, and thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, I, I was asked to make some opening remarks, and um, so I'll begin with the, I think, the uncontroversial statement that wide regional inequalities are a feature of most developed um, and indeed many developing uh, countries. Um, my focus is going, to, is going to be on developed countries in my remarks um, and drawing particularly on the, the UK case. So the UK is characterised by extremely wide regional inequalities in international terms and these are going to be overlain by the economic and indeed the health effects of the, of the current pandemic. Regional inequalities in, in many countries grew rapidly uh, from the 1980s onwards um, and this typically reflected two processes, one, the decline of regional economies, but also the concentration of economic activity in the biggest cities, particularly the concentration of advanced services and highly skilled workers in the biggest cities. Um, of course, these cities themselves are often uh, socially and geographically divided, so there's a complex pattern of urban and regional inequality which marks the world today. Typically, agglomeration economies have been seen as the driver of economic growth. These are the benefits which uh, flow, uh, which, which firms and, uh, and people derive by being clustered together. Uh, and ec economic geography in particular has paid a lot of attention to the operation of these agglomeration economies over recent times. Uh, it should also be said, of course, that the growth of big cities has been underpinned by big 
public investments in infrastructure and services. Uh, there are a couple of consequences which flow from this. The first is that um, in public policy terms, we see the emergence of what my colleague Andy Pike calls city centrism. That is, for about 40 or more years now, public policy is generally focused on promoting big cities or global cities as national champions in the uh, battle for international capital. Um, and this has been to the neglect of places outside of those cities, according to this analysis. So the focus indeed is not so much being on the biggest cities, but on their very core, so the CBDs. And we see cities competing um, to attract investment, particularly property development, into their, into their big cities, into their urban cores. And this has been um, an important driver of economic development. And um, this has happened all over the world. And I think it's in the Australian case, it's been, uh, I was very impressed recently by Gabrielle Chan's book, Rusted Off, which is, which is charted some of these processes in Australia and what it means for the places which are left out of this model of economic development. But this focus on agglomeration has been uh, challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic, where you're getting the emergence of a lot of commentary rather than analysis, I would say, which is starting to question whether the age of the global city is now over because they are the, uh, the global cities are, have been the, the hotbed of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And, and uh, the pandemic is being transferred between countries via these big international hubs. So there has been a kind of political backlash against this. Again, Gabrielle Chan uh, is kind of charting some of that in her book, Rusted Off. My colleague at uh, uh, LSE, Andres Rodriguez Posse, has analyzed the rise of populism in the UA, USA and Europe, and indeed elsewhere, in terms of what he calls the revenge of places that do not matter. So he wrote a paper about this a while, uh, a while ago, which has attracted an enormous amount of international attention. Um, and what he points out is that the places which have provided the political shocks, the populist political shocks in recent times, are the places which have been left out uh, of this new, of this model of growth focused on the big cities. So in the UK, voters in what we what, what tend to be termed left behind places delivered Brexit to some extent. But elsewhere, we might point to, as well as Brexit, the election of Trump, the rise of Marine Le Pen in France, the Lega in Italy, as feeding off this kind of sense of places being left behind. Um, and we see the beginnings of a, a shift in policy. So Boris Johnson recently elected as prime minister in the UK is uh, committed, rhetorically at least, committed himself to this idea of leveling up the idea that he's going to address some of these regional inequalities. It's not quite clear how he's going to do this or even what leveling up means, but he said he's going to do it. Um, so across the world now, in this context of the shift away from city centrism, which is a long-term thing accelerated by uh, COVID-19, the political backlash and the left behind places, um, what we're seeing is a search for policy alternatives. So it's possible that the populist moment um, uh, is passing. You know, we're seeing it in the US and in one or two other places where these insurgencies are perhaps um, uh, being rolled back. Um, but the problem remains of what do you do about these left behind places? Um, what would be the alternatives to this sort of city centrism that Andy Pike talks about? So the big question of our time, I think, is, is related to this question of how we deal with these inequalities, in particular the geography of them. So far, um, where we see alternatives, where we see policy agendas being put forward, there's a bit of a sense of that it's old wine in new bottles. That's to say, uh, in the UK, for instance, this new levelling up agenda really is about more infrastructure, about deregulation of planning and, and, and so on. Um, attempts to attract high-tech investors into left-behind places. But in reality, we've been doing a lot of that for many, many years. So um, uh, in my work with the UK 2070 Commission, which was a national commission set up in the UK, chaired by Lord Kerslick, the former head of the UK Civil Service, um, we were looking at these issues um, and the, the, the report which was produced earlier this year called for a large scale and, and, and radical rethinking of regional policy. Um, 
suggesting that very, very, very many more resources would need to be uh, committed to it than have been so far, and that we would need to do some uh, fundamental rethinking about what regional policy is all about. And one aspect of it which I was keen to uh, endorse uh, in the report was um, why sort of left behind places as, we, as they're called in the UK or maybe regional Australia um, should, why, why, why these places should escape what I would regard as the forlorn chase for mobile investors for high tech as the solution um, and focus instead on um, what we might call the foundational economy. This is a, a concept promoted by a group of researchers uh, at Manchester University, which, which suggests that the aim of economic development policy should be to focus on the collective, the provision of the collective infrastructure of daily life. That the future of economic activity is going to be about in, um, uh, ensuring high quality of life, well being, and empowering places to achieve these, uh, these objectives. So that's the kind of terrain which I've been working on over the last uh, period. Um, and which uh, I'm happy to talk about now. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, John. So I suppose um, uh, one of the things that I, I hear about a, a lot in, in uh, place-based approaches is, is an em emphasis on um, innovation as well as human, uh, as human capital. Um, do you think innovation is possible in these left behind places? Uh, well, a lot depends on what we mean by innovation. Um, one of the working assumptions of the of the big city approach to economic development is that economic innovation takes place in the bigger cities. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we attract the best people, and um, uh, investment is attracted because those people are, are, are there. Um, so we have you know, big differences in the skill profile of the workforce between, let's call them left behind places and um, uh, uh, leading places. Um, and currently the thinking is in the, in the UK, and we're seeing examples of it elsewhere, the US and, and other places, is that um, we need to build up the sort of, in, the innovation capacity of left behind places. Um, maybe investing in universities, maybe investing in new research institutes, um, in the UK, there's this suggestion that we have that, that we go for an, what's been called an MIT for the North. Britain's research and development activity is heavily concentrated around London and Oxford and Cambridge. Um, it's much less present elsewhere. You know, that's a great advantage from our university, UCL, which attracts more than its fair share, as it were, of, uh, of investment in, in R&D and so on. Um, but to to sort of replicate an MIT for the, uh, to create an MIT for the North in let's say Manchester or Leeds or somewhere like that, how would that help uh, the seaside towns which are struggling, uh, the old mill towns, um, the former mining villages of which we have many across the North of England, how would creating an MIT for the North help them? I think that's um, uh, a big question for me. Um, in some ways, it might simply accelerate divisions between the bigger cities in the north and, and the, um, the, the places which are struggling. On the other hand, if we broaden our definition of innovation, I would say that there's a huge amount of innovation taking place in these, in these smaller communities. But often, it's innovation around um, uh, social issues, around the provision of social infrastructure, if you like. Uh, in, in areas like the care of the elderly, um, uh, um, the, the um, uh, provision of uh, skills for uh, children with um, uh, educational challenges of one kind or another. So some work that we're doing at UCL is looking at a, a very small village, former mining village um, in the north of England. Um, and that's, that reveals there's a tremendous amount of social activity taking place there. And it's been revealed by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, a you know, how interesting ways in which the community has come together to look after itself and care for itself in the absence of the ability of the state to do this, really. Um, so I think there's a tremendous amount of innovation taking place in these uh, communities, but we've often overlooked it um, in pursuit of the big, shiny new buildings and 
um, high-tech investments when really what's needed in these places is social innovation, new ways of looking after the elderly, new ways of providing childcare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so innovation, I think in order to make it relevant to these places, we have to expand our definition of what innovation is. <coughs> uh, uh, John, the, the paper you wrote in relation to Australia is now 10 years old. It had some great... Old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the time flies. And those recommendations yeah. seem back then quite uh, profound and important as far as the importance of um, place-based direction. Do you really think in that decade, and I suppose in the Australian context, because you did have that um, appreciation of our three levels of government and those peculiarities there, do you think we've even responded to those recommendations in the last 10 years? Well, that's possibly not for me to say. I mean, I haven't visited Australia recently, and as things stand, I don't suspect I'll be visiting Australia in the near future <laughs> either. Um, look, I mean, my, my feeling there is that there's, there's an agenda which is still to be developed around place-based approaches to economic uh, uh, development. And um, I, I suppose you ha you've had a kind of version of it in, this, in the sense that, you, you know, the, the federal government has adopted the city deals approach, which it's taken from the UK context um, and had to adapt it to the Australian federal uh, context. I think the thing that strikes me about the Australian um, scene uh, when it comes to developing place-based approaches is, is the relative weakness of local government. Um, what you have in Australia, I think, are, you know, you have a, a decentralized system in, in, in comparative international terms. Um, you have strong state governments, clearly, um, but you, you know, clearly there's an absence uh, below the state level of strong public actors, I think. Um, I don't think this is a radical statement. It, it, it comes out very strongly from the kind of comparative analysis that the OECD does of, uh, of, of local, uh, of subnational government. Um, so my view would be that for this place-based this place-based approach to to um, to really take root in Australia. Um, you need strong and relatively autonomous local government. That's not to say that you could dispense with the states or the federal government, but that the balance of powers between the three tiers possibly needs to be readjusted. And I know there are important differences between states in terms of how local government is organised and the powers and resources it has. But in international terms, if you compare um, the, the strength of local government in Australia to other countries, local government looks to have few resources, relatively limited range of powers, um, constrained autonomy to act, essentially. Um, and I think that's a, the missing ingredient for a properly place-based approach, because the place-based approach requires empowered local actors, um, which are able to understand their, their local problems, define their own solutions, and work you know, in concert with other tiers of government, the state and, and, and the Commonwealth in, in the Australian case. Um, so whether the extent to which Australia has moved on from 10 in the last 10 years in this respect, I think, you know, to me, it's an open question. I don't have up to date knowledge about that. You, you know, it might be more interesting to hear what you think, Robert. Than, yeah. Than well, I, yeah, look, I, I think you describe, describe the context quite well because in Australia, I think our federal and state level um, policies around regional development, place-based development is quite strong. Um, it's quite, you know, it's entrenched. But the communities themselves at the place-based level, there is that issue about um, getting things done, weak local government, weak leadership, what do, and part of the philosophy, as you said, is that in, that uh, empowerment has to happen at that level. And I think the uh, comments we get mostly is not a failing at um, federal or state level, but how do um, passionate local leaders um, empower the local government to want to take risks, to want to do the work? I, I think that seems to be the messages I hear more than anything is exactly in that void you identify. I mean, my, my, my sense would be that this is true both of the metropolitan and the regional areas of Australia in the sense that 
you know, in the case of a city, let's say like Melbourne, for instance, and I was just reading some, I've been reading research on this topic recently, um, you know, what's striking to an international observer about the Australian scene is the extent to which the metropolitan areas don't have a strategic level of governance. Um, you know, you have within Melbourne or within Sydney, many local, uh, local authorities and you know, perennial problems of coordinating their activity at a sensible spatial scale. Um, and outside of uh, the big cities, yeah, you know, what you have are town halls which are reliant on uh, superior bodies for their resources uh, and which, um, uh, you know, lack the capacity really to build the local, the local coalitions which will address uh, the kinds of issues that I was talking about earlier. I think it's uh, very interesting the um, comments you made about innovation, John, because I am um, I'm a great believer that regional Australia is very innovative, and that there are a number of aspects about regional Australia um, that increase their um, capacity to be innovative. And like you, I think innovation needs to be taken away from the new and shiny, even though the new and shiny um, is in, is important. Um, and I also think you've made some valid comments about um, the capacities of local government. I'm just wondering if you could make some comments in general around the capacity of um, left behind areas or in Australia, they're not necessarily left behind so much as that they're just rural, they're not, uh, or regional, they're not related to um, a, a big city. Um, what, what your feeling is about the actual capacity for these um, places to, to learn some of the um, skills? Well, I think it's a big challenge, you know, um, if you, if there's no tradition of, uh, acting on your own account, um, then it's a difficult, you know, and there's no experience to draw upon. And I think it's it's difficult to um, uh, create that capacity because a lot of it's about confidence. It's about trust in your, uh, your networks of actors. Uh, and these things take time to build. It's a slow process. It also requires resource. Um, you know, one, what, what I find quite interesting sometimes is that in Britain we have a Department for International Development, or we did have until it was abolished by the current government, um, which um, uh, is concerned with um, uh, in providing aid to um, uh, developing countries. And at the heart of its approach over many years has been this idea that it's concerned with building capacity, building the capacity of local actors um, to, to help themselves, essentially. Um, that's not an abdication of responsibility on the part of, of national governments to say that you want them to, you want your places to build the capacity to help themselves. It's more con conceiving the role of, let's say, the Commonwealth and, and uh, state governments in Australia as enabling places to, to, to help themselves. But that's a long-term process. It requires resources. Um, it requires efforts to build that capacity to share learning between places because, uh, you know, government officials in uh, uh, in Macquarie Street in Sydney have, don't really know what's happening in rural New South Wales. Uh, similarly, in Spring Street in Victoria, in the Victorian government, heavily concentrated um, uh, sort of uh, public public service um, struggles to understand what the threats and opportunities and uh, strengths and weaknesses of, of a myriad of, of, of places across the state are. Um, and I think there's very strong evidence that strong local institutions, uh, well-run strong local institutions, play a key role in, in promoting development. Um, and that's particularly true if you're thinking about development in terms not just of attracting mobile investors but instead thinking about how we build communities which are resilient which uh, uh, which have high levels of well-being um, in which uh, key social service uh, key, key public services like education health utilities water etc are provided in a uh, uh, in a way which sustains what you might call civilized life really so uh, 
this is this is where I uh, uh, I think in the Australian context uh, in the national context Australia looks like a place where stronger local government would be an important ingredient um, uh, and it's not just a question of building that capacity, but it's also sustaining it over time. Um, and there's, there's good evidence from around the world of how this can be done. Um, but it's a question of the political will to see this, really. John, John I wonder in, at that scale, what would um, empowered local actors do if they can't activate their local government to want to do something? in the sense that, you know, that place-based approach, as you've said, is, is one thing about capacity, but then in acting upon it. And if, are there other pathways if um, our local government institutions are just too slow or they aren't agile enough, particularly now in the new normal, which is testing all our institutions? Yes. You know, at the place-based level, is that going to create a vacuum or a void where some other governance structure will need to be driven if these communities have any future? Well, I think, I think local government and, and stronger local government has got, you know, has got to be at the heart of all of, all of this. But I think you know, one of the debates about um, that's taking place in, in various countries around the world, the UK is a good example of this, is the extent to which uh, you know, strong and confident local governments don't necessarily see themselves as leaders of their communities, but enablers of their communities. So in the same way that, you know, in an Australian context, you would think about how more power and resource could be transferred down from the state level to the local level to, you know, to, to sort of empower places to act. There'd be a key task then to devolve, as it were, power from local government into the wider community. If I think about the left behind places that we're studying in, in the UK at the moment, and this is also true of other places like um, Italy, where there's some interesting work being done, and, and, and Spain. Um, what you see is that much of the dynamism in these communities comes not necessarily from local government, but from voluntary organisations, non-governmental organisations, community associations, people doing things for themselves. And where, where, where those organisations have the maximum effect is where local government enables and supports them rather than tries to control them. Um, and I th again, I think the evidence on this is quite strong, but it's difficult evidence for politicians in particular <laughs> and, and public services to take on board because it implies giving up power, sharing power, sharing sovereignty over issues. Um, and that's something which they, they find uh, very difficult to do. And I, what, what I see, I think, in in the UK at the moment, you see it to some extent in France at the moment as well, and the Macron is the is in the because because doing all of that local stuff is very difficult. It's much easier, in a sense, to build up the centre, mm. um, you know, to to try and build up the centre to to do things in the absence of, of local capacity. So what you have are the you know people at the centre pulling these levers, although they they discover that these levers aren't actually connected to anything. <laughs> And they don't make much of a difference uh, locally. And this is, to me, further evidence of the need to build up uh, capacity in a broad sense, of which where local government's at the centre of it, but it's not dominating activity locally, it's enabling uh, activity locally. Is this difficult? Of course it's difficult. Um, and in some places will rise to that challenge, if you like, uh, better than others. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and some places will have, you know, will all have the networks, the trust, the social capital, if you like, to uh, to, to to pursue this route. Other places won't, and it, it'll, it'll take longer. So there's always got to be a, a balance between local action and extra local action. Um, but and where that balance, in terms of how you reform local government to achieve that, the story is very different in different state in different countries because. The the, uh, the the pattern of um, you know the pattern of central local relations is different in each country. How people think about these issues uh, is 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 different in each issue. So for an outsider, you know, considering Australian scene, the very term regional Australia takes some getting getting your head around. And when I talk about Australia back in the UK or 
say the European Commission in Brussels or whatever, and you, and you use this term regional Australia, you have to explain more people what this means. Because in Europe, everywhere is part of a region. But in Australia, only some places are regions. How does that work? Um, you know, so this distinction between the metropolitan and regional Australia um, is, is, a, is a unique sort of Australian discourse. And there's versions of, you know, every place has its unique discourse. Every place has its uh, um, um, balance of forces between centre and, 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 and locality. Um, and where the reforms, some places do it rather well, I think, some federal systems like Germany have been revealed, I think, to have performed extraordinarily well in this current pandemic compared to highly centralized systems like, say, the UK, which I think has performed pretty poorly. Um, so the, these, the issues are all, there's a national context for this discussion. Um, and I'm just offering some observations as an outsider rather than telling, telling Australians what they should be doing. Look, John, if I can just interrupt um, here for a minute to give the audience a chance to um, have a couple of comments. Um, we've got one from Andrew in South Australia saying that you're spot on about local government. They do have resources, but they don't know how to engage with the private sector. I think that that's something that I'll uh, come back to shortly. Um, that local government administrations in a very cosy situation of secure jobs, pensions and automatic pay rises um, also, there's an erosion of the local elected members um, and local government are struggling to throw off its own uh, red tape. Um, and then Russell, I'm not sure where Russell is from, has said um, that you're absolutely correct on the imbalance of power. As someone who spent a large part of my professional life in the US, I find the colonialist approach to management by local government by the state is exceptionally stifling, particularly with the over allocation of power to elected officials who too frequently don't have the knowledge to make decisions on professional officers' advice and also aren't able to effectively lobby the state government for changes that would enhance local government autonomy. So um, I think there's something there about um, the imbalance of power and I want to come back to that in terms of stakeholders um, in, a, in a little minute. Um, another one from Andrew in South Australia, spot on building on also building local institutions that help locals help themselves is vital. Um, and then Bruce, who's saying, um, I get frustrated with the building capacity story. I see lots of capacity built, but then has limited opportunity for, for activation. So I suppose I'm seeing um, all of those comments wrapping up um, three things, which is, is in regard to power, um, how you engage with the business community and issues of transparency and accountability and arm's length um, and uh, how, how um, it's, it's easier I suppose to share power with voluntary groups or neighbourhood groups um, but uh, how do you share power with um, people who are uh, perhaps wanting to be more advocates um, over a particular issue. So can I throw that back to you, John? There's quite a few issues there. Blimey, yeah, there's a lot to get my teeth into there. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> what, you know, I'm, I'm advocating the building of a local capacity for, for communities to help themselves, but I'm, you know, I'm not doing that in a naive way. I understand that that's a very difficult task, but it's, from my point of view, it's hard to see what the alternatives are. We've tried the top-down approaches, um, and they haven't solved the problems that we all agree need to be solved. Um, <clears throat> the task of engaging beyond, you know, the task for local government and or any other tier of government um, to, to engage beyond, you know, with actors, with other actors, I think is a perennial one. Um, certainly, you know, we had a period in, in countries like the UK and Australia uh, where for 30 or 40 years there were arrangements between employers, governments, trade unions and so on to, to agree the big matters of state, if you like. But those systems have, have broken down partly because of uh, the changing nature of the economy, but partly also because of changing attitudes um, and this idea that you can have these peak organisations which um, uh, can agree what the issues are uh, in, in, in closed rooms, in what we used to call in the UK smoke-filled rooms, um, they, uh, those days are over. That that isn't that isn't going to work. 
we have a problem in 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 terms of the accountability issue that you were talking about which is that our systems of representative democracy are essentially in crisis in all of our countries across the western world there's lots of evidence that people have declining faith in democracy to solve problems um, that's a different issue to the one that saying politicians they're all the same kind of thing um, or, or I don't like politicians that it's, it's, a, it's a much more it's a much more intractable and structural uh, issue so we need to we need to rethink what, what we mean by accountability and the role of our elected representatives I think um, I'm not advocating getting rid of them in any shape or form um, and I'm you know I think it's very easy to blame politicians when they're caught uh, they're dealing with a lot of structural dilemmas if you like so uh, there's a set of there's a set of issues uh, there that I think we need to think about you know what what is a modern politician what, what should be their connection to their community um, <clears throat> how do we train them you know I mean this is a this is a strange world I mean the world of local politics you know you have local mayors or whatever who come in to come into office very often and you know they have, it's one of the few professions you could enter these days without any training whatsoever um, so you know how do we how do we train our <clears throat> um, and qualify if you like our politicians while at the same time um, avoiding this kind of professionalization of politics which disconnects the political class from its communities these are these are huge issues to which there is no, um, uh, no there are no easy answers um, that could also be said of the of the kind of world of voluntary networks and so on which are very important particularly in the most disadvantaged communities you know is there are there ways in which we can uh, you know help the actors in those communities um, to improve, improve their ability to get things done. Um, you know, can you train community activists? Is it the job of the state um, um, to, to do all of this kind of thing? And this is, you know, going beyond, uh, you know, and going, going beyond just, you know, how to chair a meeting or whatever, but, you know, how, how, to, how, how, to be act, how, how to be an active citizen. It's possibly something we need to teach in schools, you know, so that you know, there used to be a tradition of civics in schools um, in many countries, which has become rather, rather marginal, uh, rather diminished. Someone made the point in one of the questions about the marginalisation of politicians and the extent to which local government and indeed government at all government at all levels is in the hands of permanent public servants rather than the elected representatives. It's all, these are all part of the, the same problem of how we rebalance, if you like, um, the different elements of our political system, whether it's in terms of the tiers of government or in terms of the actors who are involved in those, uh, those tiers of government. The big challenge, you know, there's a huge challenge to engage not just business, but beyond business, um, social actors in a meaningful and, and productive and constructive way in the formulation of strategies to help uh, these places and none of these none of these problems are, are are easily solved and and in many cases i don't think they're really even on the political agenda um uh you know for for national and, and state governments um they they never reach the top of the political agenda there may be occasional discussions about them there may be awareness that something needs to be done but there's always more important things for prime ministers and premiers to do than worry about building capacity in Wagga Wagga, for instance. Um, you know, so that's uh, that's where we are on all of that. So, I mean, many of the problems we're talking about, I think, are caught up in larger issues about how our how Western democracies work, really, and how they're perceived to be failing, if you like, um, in many ways, um, to to meet the needs of their citizens. Yeah, John, I wonder, um, come back to your great analogy of the old wine and new bottles. Mm. Is, you know, that real challenge that we're at a point where we, we need a radical rethinking, we want different outcomes, we've got to do things different. And I wonder, um, just as you've been painting that context, is that really saying to us, if we're going to ever get a different outcome that clearly isn't working for regions, is it time for something, some radical thinking? And what might that be? I mean, how do we get to that point? What well, is I mean, I, 
we definitely need radical thinking. Um, I mean, there's, there's radical thinking in the UK at the moment, but in my view, a lot of it's the wrong radical thinking. So, um, you know, we have a we have a national government in the UK which is committed to this agenda of levelling up, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and on the face of it, it, you know, they're presenting this as a radical agenda, but the more I look into it, the more I see, the, you know, the more I see the government travelling over old ground. Um, so, for instance, uh, I mean, let's think of an example. Well, a couple of examples. One is infrastructure. You know, what, what these places need is better, better communications, better roads. Um, huge amount of evidence from across Europe that huge amounts of money have been spent on new roads um, and, you know, by the European Commission, by the European Union. Um, which have had no real discernible impact on regional inequalities. Yet somehow the idea persists that physical infrastructure is the solution to these problems. Um, and, you know, the, the current government in the UK has called for shovel-ready infrastructure projects, you know, as part of the post-COVID-19 rebuilding recovery uh, programme. And um, that always sends a bit of a shiver down my spine when I hear that phrase, because, you know, Where's the evidence that building a new road is going to make much of a difference here? Um, we know that what's really lacking in these places is kind of social the, the, the capacity that we're that we're talking about. No one's discussing about no one's discussing how we build that. We, we're discussing how we're going to build new roads, widen roads, build new road junctions, and so on. So that that's an, so another idea which is currently um, uh, top of the political agenda in the UK as far as this leveling up agenda is concerned. Is the introduction of free ports again you know uh, these are sort of area designated areas which have uh, uh, tax incentives and other kinds of incentives to locate your economic activity um, to process essentially um, uh, manufacturing and other goods again you know the evidence that this is going to make a difference on the underlying problems is extraordinarily weak extraordinarily weak yet we're gonna this, this is this is a kind of big priority uh for for the government there's no evidence that it's going to make any, any difference to the issues so that's the old wine in new bottles my you know the ideas which are which are particularly attractive uh to me at the moment and which got a lot of airing in the in in, in um in the kerslick uh, report that, that that i was involved with are these ideas around the foundational economy this idea that um, the key task is to rebuild the foundations of local communities in terms of the provision of uh, collective services primarily. Uh, what makes the most difference in the places which need the most help are, are decent schools, the availability of doctors, a local doctors, uh, uh, um, uh, a good environment, a healthy high street, these are the things that people want. And there's lots which governments, local, state, national can do to create these conditions. And these contribute not necessarily to um, a productivity improvements in the conventional sense of the term, uh, growth and economic output, GDP or whatever, but they contribute enormously to people's sense of well-being. And this is the direction I, I would suggest is, is the one we need to be heading in in the future. An approach to economic development which is focused on the promotion of well-being rather than the promotion of economic growth narrowly defined by measures such as uh, GDP and you know we, we, we all know the limits of you know there's a, there's a huge long discussion about the limits of uh, these measures of economic development which go right back to the 1960s it was Robert Kennedy who made the first political statement questioning whether GDP was a really good was it was a good way to measure our economic progress um, so, you know, for instance, in, in the UK, there's been a big debate about um, loneliness, right? You know, this, this problem of loneliness. I've, I've seen uh, similar discussions about it uh, in, in, in relation to regional Australia. The fact that many people, particularly elderly people uh, living on their own, who are disconnected from the kind of privatised, commercialised forms of services which we all consume, live very lonely lives, you know? And there's a lot of evidence that uh, loneliness kills. It reduces your life expectancy. But you know, do you ever hear of, of governments, local, state, or federal, saying that you know we need to we need to tackle the problem of loneliness? How do we do that? 
how do we how do we reconnect people with their communities? Um, so these these are the sorts of issues uh, which I think are um, key, really, and uh, need to be. You know, if we're radically rethinking our approach to economic development, these issues need to be brought up the political agenda, and the idea that we're going to you know land a new research and development center for the latest gadget um, needs to move down a little bit. That's not to say that those things aren't important, but that we've lost the balance between uh, these, these issues that I've been talking about and the more conventional uh, ways of measuring economic development. Um, another comment here from Angus from uh, Sydney. The UK has embraced comprehensively the concept of UNESCO global geoparks. There are eight in total which are based on the concept of a holistic sense of place relating landscape and geology as well as other areas of natural heritage to human activity in the recent list of approved geo global geoparks. The uh, UNESCO Black Country Global Geopark has embraced former coal mining areas located west of Birmingham. Do you think that global geoparks embracing geotourism, education and conservation are innovative mechanisms for building a stronger sense of place in regional areas? Yeah, uh, um, I think in principle, I, I you know, I'm, I'm not actually in London at the moment. I'm in the north of England, um, at my home in the north of England, and um, I'm very close to a geopark uh, in the northern Pennines of England. And it's really interesting, I mean, it's, you know, this is my homeland, if you like. Um, so stop me if I go on too long <laughs> to talk about this. But um, it's a former lead mining area, the Geo Park. Um, it's a it's a place which has lost population through the whole of the 20th century, really, as the lead mines have closed and uh, disappeared. And what you're left with is this this kind of you know unique mix of um, uh, agricultural industrial heritage. Um, plus what I suppose we call it an, a natural environment or in English terms a remote nat natural environment the, you know with um, uh, tremendous biodiversity uh, lots of endangered species of birds and, and, and so on I spend a lot of time there um, you know recharging my mental batteries so I'm, I'm a big fan of this kind of thing geoparks and so on um, I'd say two things about them uh, you know, they do exist, but their profile is quite low. Um, you know, I I, um, I go to I go to a place called Weirdale, which is near, not too far from here. I spend a lot of time there, rooting around old quarries and um, um, uh, um, lead mines and so on. And I, I absolutely love it. But um, you know, I very rarely see anybody else there uh, when I'm doing these things. So. That's, that's something to bear in mind, that uh, there's a lot of these geoparks, but their actual profile and public understanding of them is quite limited. Where I think they, they're they getting a boost now, though, because uh, because of the pandemic, you know, we've had the situation in the UK where traditionally it's been very popular to head at this time of year in our summer to the, to the south of Europe, to Spain, Portugal, Italy, etc., Greece, and um, bake in the sun. Um, Whereas this year, that's, it, that's become much more difficult. Um, there's a huge move towards having holidays within the UK. Um, and that's giving a tremendous boost uh, to the, uh, the local um, tourist industry. Um, it's, it's, it's impossible to get a cottage in any of these places at the moment. Um, so, it's the, you know... I don't want to second guess what, uh, what the long-term implications of the pandemic are for the tourist industry. In two or three years' time, we might all be back on planes to uh, the Algarve or Costa del Sol. Um, but uh, there are opportunities here at the moment to reconsider what tourism is, what the offer is, um, and for people to re you know, and, and people are re-engaging with, uh, with their uh, home landscape in a way which... Uh, I think is is potentially very productive. Um, so yeah, geoparks are great, but I wouldn't overstate their their their, their actual impact. Um, another another question um, is in Australia, our national broadcaster is running a weekly program titled "Escape from the City," based on a program developed by the BBC entitled 
escape to the country. Do you think these mm. programs and other marketing programs are actually capable of attracting key knowledge workers to enhance the capability of regional places, rising above the promoted aspiration of attracting people to escape so that they can freely operate human service sector roles such as retail and hospitality? We had a discussion about this last week where in um, re inland regional Australia, we have um, more jobs than people. Yeah. Um, tree, uh, you call them tree changes in Australia, don't you? People who leave the city to go and live in the country. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know what the impact of those programs is. I mean, we do have, I know the one you're talking about, um, escape to the country it's kind of daytime tv fodder so i don't often see it i guess but um the uh uh yeah i'm not sure how much that uh makes much of a difference um to be honest um much of the escape to the country thing in the uk consists of retired people cashing in their um the capital gains on their houses in the cities and using them to move to the country where they get more house and more space and for their money and so on. Uh, and I'm sure that's true. I mean, I know that's true in places like France and, uh, and other countries as well, because I know people who are doing it. Um, so, but I've not made a special study of this, so I don't know. What I would say is that there's a huge amount of um, media commentary at the moment. Uh, there's a piece actually in the Financial Times, I think, this last weekend or the weekend before in the UK about uh, the sense in which the, the pandemic is accelerating this, may accelerate this move away from the big cities. Um, because traditionally there's been a premium on being located as close as possible to the big job markets. Um, in London, for instance, um, there's been a big premium on being close to the amenities which somewhere like London offers, the restaurants, the bars, the galleries, the theatres and so on, they're all closed. And what this is doing, according to some recent commentary, is, is leading people to rethink what it is they want out of life. Is it, um, uh, uh, you know, is, is it these access to these jobs and amenities or is it space? Is it a garden? Is it the things which are much more difficult to, to obtain in the city? Um, there's a lot of hot takes on all of this, you know, I mean, if you read uh, the likes of the Financial Times or some of the magazines, um, international magazines on this kind of thing, there's a lot of discussion about it. I think it's very early to, to uh, you know, to, to judge where we're heading in, in, in all of this, you know, and I think a lot of people are making claims at the moment, which might not look all that smart in five years time. Um, but so but it's something to watch that. And there may, be, there may well be opportunities for regional areas which are seeking to attract people, particularly people with skills um, uh, to, to, to locate in their, their area. I mean, working from home, you know, a lot of people are now arguing, you know, that with working from home, no one's gonna go back to central London. Even now, you know, even though the economy is opening up again, the city of London, the financial district, people tell me and i haven't been there but people tell me it's still empty you know so uh big banks are saying we never expect 100 percent of people to come back to us uh you know people can people have demonstrated they can work remotely now if we have the capacity the technology and also people enjoy it you know the big problem the uk government has got is getting people to go back into the office people don't want to go back and many people don't want to go back into the office I mean, perhaps many young people do. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of generational aspect in all of this, which is important. Um, but yeah, I think the, the world is the world has changed. Whether it resets to where it, to the status quo ante um, remains to be seen. But uh, there may well be opportunities in all this um, and, and new ways of doing things. Yeah, John, I'd just like to confirm your your talk about the. Um foundational economy because you know COVID has really reinforced that localism and communities supporting local business looking at the local food health well-being um, which a lot of in, um, classic regional brand qualities for regional life in a way and maybe as you've said with that uh, foundational economy emerging maybe there is an opportunity or a window there for 
maybe regions to embrace that more mm. or formalize it more? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, certainly, it's certainly uh, it's, worth thinking about um, all of that. And, you know, for, for anybody who's sort of uh, attracted by the, um, the notion of thinking through this frame of the foundational economy, I'd recommend you have a look at the uh, website uh, which has been established by at the University of Manchester. And just Google foundational economy. It will take you. There's lots of free resource um, papers and so on. Some fantastic uh, recent report about the forestry industry in Wales and the extent to which that can be uh, viewed through this lens of the foundational economy. Very relevant to parts of Australia, I, I, I would have thought. Um, interesting work um, being done on, on a similar vein in Italy um, and you'll find the connections through that website to these to the different work that's been done in Austria and Germany and um, and so on and um, the key, one of the key writers to, to look at in relation to this is Carol Williams that's K-A-R-E-L Williams it's a Welsh uh, name and uh, Carol Williams and his colleagues of uh, really pioneered this this way of thinking, but it's it's now spreading certainly across Europe um, uh, and getting more and more attention. And I think it's the, from my from my point of view, it's the most thoroughly uh, innovative way of thinking about how the economy works. It asks you to think differently about how the economy works, and then to think about what the implications of that are for local economic development policy. Um, I think it's relevant in principle everywhere, but the way the foundational economy works is different in every place. Um, so there are, there's no simple kind of here's the answer approach associated with this perspective. It's you need to understand what's going on in your local economy. You need to understand where effective interventions will be uh, best made, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that, again, sort of speaks to this issue of building the capacity to be able to do this which not all places have. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, listen, uh, John, it's, uh, we've got three minutes left to go. Um, so thank you very, very much for um, your uh, participation in today's session. I found it very, very uh, stimulating. Are there are a couple of closing remarks you'd like to make. Um, well, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to, to, to contribute today um, and for the questions that I've that I've been able to answer. Uh, oh, um, sorry if I if you had a burning question and I wasn't able to answer. Please feel free to drop me an email, and if I, if I can, I'll I'll do my best to, to respond. Um, I mean, these these are you know we're in extraordinary times. That's a cliche, and I don't say that, but it's true. Um, I think that radical rethinking needs to be taken and needs 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 to be undertaken in relation to the challenges. Uh, that we face, and I, you know, I wish Segra and all my Australian friends the best of luck in, in, in doing all of that. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, um, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.